Hello fleet and welcome back to episode 23 of Know Your Ship with me Chase and today's episode is a bit of a special episode. This episode will hopefully be the beginning of a new mini-series that covers all the various paper ship designs that were created by many of the different uh, nations in the, around the world. And today's episode, of course, is going to be probably one of the most famous paper ship designs, the Montana-class battleships. Now, before I get into the actual nitty-gritty details about this particular ship, um, I just have one thing to say, which is um, I finally took the introduction I made last time, made it shorter, changed the music, and uh, hopefully it's better than what I had the first time around. So let me know what you think in the comment section below, and um, hopefully I'll keep it if it's good enough. Aside from that, um, this episode, unlike many of the other ones I've made, will not have any sort of wartime or combat footage, so probably on that front it'll be a little bit less exciting, but I'll try to make it as entertaining as I possibly can, even though this is a completely sort of theoretical conceptual design. Aside from that, uh, I want you to all just sit back, relax, and hopefully you pick up something new. The task of designing U.S. warships fell upon a number of different bureaus. Amongst these was the Bureau of Construction and Repair, also known as CNR. CNR's primary responsibility was to design the ship's hull. There was also the Bureau of Engineering, also known as Buang, and Buang's responsibility was the design of the ship's machinery. Now, both of these bureaus were in existence up until 1940, but in 1940, the Navy merged both these bureaus into one called the Bureau of Ships. So if you hear sometime during the episode where I, you know, sort of switch from CNR and Bureau of Engineering to Bureau of Ships, you'll understand why, because it's, you know, the year had sort of transitioned from 39 to 40 something as the designs went from, you know, these two bureaus to the latter bureau. There was also the Bureau of Ordnance, which was responsible for the ship's armor and armament. However, interestingly, after the merger of the CNR and the Bureau of Engineering, and you had the Bureau of Ships, the responsibility for armor protection was split as well, with the Bureau of Ordnance being responsible for side armor plating, and the Bureau of Ships being responsible for deck armor as well as splinter plating. These bureaus were coordinated essentially by the U.S. Navy General Board. The U.S. Navy General Board comprised of a number of senior admirals that were reaching the end of their careers, and it was their job to advise the bureaus about the characteristics of different warships. However, the General Board's job was to give advice only, and the final decision for any warship design lay with the Secretary of the Navy. Eventually, though, the General Board was replaced by the Chief of Naval Operations, which still exists today. The decision to design the new U.S. battleship came with the implementation of a new battleship shell, that being the 16-inch Mark 8 2,700-pound super heavy shell that was going to be in use on the Iowas and the South Dakotas. Now, this shell had greater penetrating power than the earlier 2,200-pound shells. This is actually really interesting, because there's this commonly held misconception, and in fact it's even on Wikipedia, that the Montana-class battleships were designed to counter the Japanese Yamato-class battleships. But then if you think about it, this doesn't really make much sense. The Japanese Yamato-class battleships, their armament, their specifications, their capabilities, their performance in battle, were not fully known to the Allies until after World War II. This made it very, very improbable that American designers were sitting in their design bureaus in 1939, coming up with a design to counter a ship that they knew very, very little about. Not only that, but typical battleship design philosophy went something like this. A ship has to be protected from the very shells that it can fire from its own guns. With these new Mark 8 shells, the Iowas were no longer protected from the shells that it can itself fire. This resulted in the design of the Iowas to be considered obsolete by the designers, and therefore a new and better protected design was sought. In mid-1939, the General Board approached CNR and asked them to sketch a series of new battleship designs. These ships were to displace no more than 45,000 tons, carry 12 16-inch guns, be protected against the new Mark 8 shells, and be capable of about 27 knots. The displacement limitation existed because at the time, the United States was still bound by the London Naval Treaty. So CNR went ahead and examined a series of studies that they did in 1938 and concluded that the ideal 12-gun battleship to fit the requirements would have to be about 785 to about 800 feet long and use the South Dakota's power plant. A ship that would be shorter would actually save weight, but the increase in the required engine power to get the speed that is required would then offset any of the sort of the weight savings that would be gained from making a shorter hull. Nevertheless, with these sort of specifications and limitations in mind, the best that CNR could do was produce a ship that would be protected against the old 2250 pound shell rather than the new 2700 pound super heavy shell. So anyways, the initial designs that CNR came up with in 1939 were as follows. 
BB-65A was basically a South Dakota with an extra turret and would displace 45,435 tons. The same ship, protected against the Mark 8 shells fired from the guns carried on the South Dakotas, the 16-inch 45 cals, would displace over 47,000 tons. Both of these went over the treaty limitations and were therefore discarded. BB-65B replaced the 5-inch 38 secondaries with 6-inch 47s and would displace 45,658 tons. The 6-inch 47s were a secondary gun that was in design at the time, however they would not actually be used on any ship until after World War II. BB-65C used quad turrets, the kind of turrets used by the Royal Navy in their King George V class ships, but the ones that would carry, I guess, bigger guns, these 16-inch guns instead. And they initially appeared to save weight, displacing only about 43,800 tons, and it was suggested that on this kind of hull, protection from the 2,700-pound Super Heavy shell would actually be feasible. BB-65D was basically the BB-65C, but with the 6-inch 47s, displacing about 44,021 tons. The culmination of the BB-65C design was BB-65E. BB-65E displaced 44,793 tons and had deck armor that matched that of the Iowa-class battleships, but offering a reduced immunity range against the new Super Heavy shells. To achieve an Iowa-class immunity range of 18 to 30,000 yards would require a ship that displaced 50 to 55,000 tons, way beyond what the London Naval Treaty allowed. In addition, the quad turrets provided an additional problem to the designers. Unlike the triple turrets, they were much heavier and required greater electrical power. The Bureau of Engineering estimated that the quad turrets would require 10,000 kilowatts of power, compared to the 7,000 kilowatts used by the South Dakota's triple turrets. This would require a significantly bigger power plant, which added way more weight than CNR had allowed. Then, starting with BB-65F, there was an attempt to sacrifice firepower for protection. The designers sacrificed one triple turret in order to provide better armor protection. This led to a whole series of ships from BB-65F all the way to BB-65I. The most extreme option actually came in the form of BB-65J, that opted for 12 14-inch guns and full protection from the 2700-pound shell fired from the 16-inch 50 caliber guns between 20 and 30,000 yards. Yet the lack of improved firepower led the designers to go back and revise earlier designs. The whole slew of BB-65C revisions that you saw earlier contained a variety of gun configurations, everything from 10-gun designs with two triples in the front and a quad in the back, and 11-gun configurations with two quads and a triple, yet none of these designs were fully satisfactory. However, soon enough, world events will quickly lead to greater flexibility in battleship designs. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland and World War II officially begins. The limitations imposed by the London Naval Treaty are lifted, even though America is not yet in the war. And on October the 24th of 1939, the General Board requests new battleship designs. These new battleships were to be equipped with 12 16-inch guns, protection from the Mark 8 shell between 18 and 30,000 yards, secondary armament consisting of 20 5-inch 38s, one design is to be capable of 27.5 knots, and the other 32.5 knots. Estimates suggested that the 27.5 knot ship would displace about 50,000 tons, and the 32.5 knot ship would displace about 55,000 tons. However, both of these estimates were proved to be wildly optimistic. As the designs grew to meet the requirements, there was the prospect that the most severe limitation, the ship's ability to pass through the Panama Canal, might be relaxed, giving even greater flexibility to the designers. This eventually proved to be correct because on February the 12th of 1940, the Secretary of the Navy asked the Secretary of War to make a third set of locks for the Panama Canal. These locks, these new locks, were to be 140 feet wide. Money was allocated in the fiscal year 40 budget for these gates to be constructed, and a target completion date of 1945-46 was set. These new locks would be reserved for U.S. warships, and only when the other locks were being overhauled or overloaded would foreign warships and merchant ships be allowed through. This is interesting enough because another misconception that many people have about the Montana-class battleships is that these ships were expected to sail around South America in order to move from the Pacific to the Atlantic or vice versa. While the construction of these locks were suspended once America entered World War II, one has to understand that the designers who were designing the Montana-class battleships were doing so with the understanding that there would be locks wide enough to accommodate them during operations. From January 1940 to February 1940, a series of initial designs were drawn up to satisfy the requirements laid out by the General Board. 
The first five designs from BB65-1 to BB65-5 try to satisfy the 12 16-inch gun and 27.5 knot requirement. The BB65-1 to BB65-5 series would have the South Dakota's power plant, a secondary armament comprised of 25-inch guns. The BB65-2 and the BB65-4 would have 25-inch 54s instead of the 5-inch 38s carried by the 1 and the 3. The BB-65-1 and 2 had a thicker belt, which meant a lower minimum immunity range of 18,000 rather than 20,000 yards of the BB-65-3 and the BB-65-4. The BB-65-5 was probably the best protected in the series, with an armor immunity zone from 18 to 32,000 yards. On the other hand, the fast battleship requirement was much more difficult to do. A whole series of BB sketches, the BBY-1 to the BBY-3, were drawn up to examine the possibilities of reaching 32 and a half knots. What they discovered was that in order to reach that kind of speed, the ship would have to be at least 1,000 feet long and have a very large engine. The best that an Iowa's engine can provide, that being around 212,000 shaft horsepower, was roughly 31.5 knots for a 1,000 foot long ship. A 320,000 shaft horsepower engine was required for speeds around 33 knots and above. This large engine would take up a substantial amount of space, an incredible 308 feet of a 590 foot armored box, compared to the only 176 feet required for the South Dakota's 130,000 shaft horsepower engine that was used on the slower 27.5 knot ship designs. This is where we begin to see the logic behind the eventual decision to build the Montanas with a slower speed than the preceding Iowa class ships. There were also a few other sketches made between January and February of 1940, that being the BB-65-6, 7, 8B, and 8C designs. All these designs were modifications of the BBY-1 to Y-3 sketches, with the most extreme being the BB-65-8 designs, which were absolute monsters, displacing close to 80,000 tons loaded, be close to 1,100 feet long, and be capable of 33 knots. On February the 16th of 1940, the General Board asked for another series of studies to be done. This led to these designs between March and July of 1940. Confusingly enough though, the design bureaus used many of the same designations to label these designs as they did in their January and February designs, so bear with me here while I try to get through this without confusing you all too much. The BB-65-1 was a modified Iowa-class ship that would be slower by 2 knots but have better protection. BB-65-2 was an enlarged Iowa that would have heavy protection and be capable of 33 knots, the same speed that the Iowas were capable of. BB-65-3 and 4 were more developed versions of the earlier ships with the same designation. BB-65-5 was to be a 12-gun ship, immune to 32,000 yards, a speed of 28 knots, be 930 feet in length, and have an engine that would produce 150,000 shaft horsepower. BB-65-6 was a 12-gun, 31-knot, 1,050-foot-long ship, displacing 64,500 tons with an Iowa engine. BB-65-7 was a 33-knot design, protected to 30,000 yards, displacing 65,000 tons. BB-65-8 was to be protected on the same hull as BB-65-7, between 18 and 32,000 yards, displacing 67,000 tons with a 320,000 shaft horsepower engine, pushing the ship to 33 knots. BB-65-9 and BB-65-10 were designs drawn up in June of 1940. These 10 designs offer the entire spectrum of possible ship designs, everything from really fast ships, slow but well armored ships, and ships that lay somewhere in the middle. With the fall of France on June the 25th, 1940, there was a sudden realization that soon Great Britain might follow, and that the Royal Navy might fall under the control of the German Kriegsmarine. Many feared that with the US Navy in its present state, it could not fight both the Japanese Navy in the Pacific and the strengthened Kriegsmarine in the Atlantic. This realization pushed through a new authorization plan for the two ocean navy. However, this did have an effect on ship designs. All of a sudden, there was this new pressure to produce as many ships as possible in as little time as possible. Ships like the Cleveland class light cruiser were built even though there were better designs on the drawing boards. This also led to the building of two additional Iowa class ships, BB-65 and BB-66, the Illinois and the Kentucky, pushing the Montana class designs to BB-67. Hoping that a new battleship design would be approved for BB-67 onwards, the General Board submitted new characteristics to the Secretary of the Navy for approval, which, when granted, was passed on to the Bureau of Ships, which began another series of studies. In additional note, however, the approval granted by SECNAV on August the 19th of 1940 was not for the construction of these new ships, but rather the pursuit of a new design. 
The first BB-67 design was BB-67-1. The length of the ship was limited to 890 feet due to the limitations of the new building docks at Norfolk and the Philadelphia Navy Yards. During this time, however, the Bureau of Ordnance increased the muzzle velocity of the 16-inch 50 caliber gun from 2,470 feet per second to 2,500 feet per second. This required the armor thickness to be changed in order to provide a similar immunity zone. The belt armor had to be increased to 16.1 inches thick, but the deck armor could be reduced to 5.8 inches since the shells would now travel in a flatter trajectory. This also provides another piece of evidence that the Montanas were built in accordance to what the US Navy knew about the penetrating power of their own weapons, rather than the knowledge of the Japanese 18.1 inch guns that were placed on the Yamato. This change in armor thickness led to the BB-67-2 design. The Bureau of Ships also provided these new designs with protection against underwater hits, something that was not taken into account with the earlier 1940 designs. BB-67-3 was designed with the discovery that BB-67-2 was actually overpowered. The 212,000 shaft horsepower Iowa engine pushed BB-67-2 to 29 knots. That extra knot of speed, however, was very, very pricey, since a 170,000 shaft horsepower engine could have driven the ship at 28 knots, even though they did eventually select a 172,000 shaft horsepower engine. This led to a redesign in terms of machinery space, which saved a substantial amount of weight. Finally, BB-67-4 was a slight modification to BB-67-3, with a slight increase of the armored freeboard. The freeboard is the distance between the waterline to the upper deck, and they increased it from 8 to 9 feet. It was this final design, BB-67-4, that was the eventual design that was chosen for production, with authorization to build five new battleships, the Montana, the Ohio, the Maine, the New Hampshire, and the Louisiana. However, due to limitations in building facilities, none of the Montana-class ships were laid down in 1941. By April of 1942, President Roosevelt had suspended construction of these battleships in favor of more aircraft carriers, and all five Montana-class battleships were formally cancelled on July the 21st, 1943, the last U.S. battleships to be designed. And that's all folks, hope you enjoyed this episode on the Montana-class battleships. I sincerely apologize for taking so long to get this video up. It has, I think, almost been two weeks since my last Warships upload, and it's just, wow, I mean, I didn't think it would be as hard as it was, but... I mean, these paper ships, it's a lot more technical, and a lot of times you're looking at something and you have no idea what's going on, and you're just you know, trying to piece it together in your head, and I hope I, I've done a reasonably good job, and so that's kind of giving you guys a decent understanding of these ships. Anyways, aside from that, uh, if you like what I'm doing, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel, as I'll be uploading more videos in the upcoming days and weeks. If you have comments, questions, anything else about this particular ship, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll try my absolute best to get back to you all on those questions. Aside from that, I uh, hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you all on the high seas.